I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. Well, it's a long, long journey to the capital city. It's a long, long wait while I'm sitting in committee. But I know I'll be a law someday, at least I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. Gee, Bill, you certainly have a lot of patience and courage. Welcome everyone to my favorite, I love Schoolhouse Rock, um, part two of our presentation this week, um, do a brief primer on public policy and ed policy overall. So let me get over there right now, give me one second, I'm still getting used to navigating with my recording and everything like that, so great, all right, wonderful. So. Like I said, yes, this will be a public policy primer. We're not going to be going over how a bill is made into a law. I hope you know how, to, how that works already. So, all right. Um, like I said, education policy and context, a brief primer on public policy, and then the base of Fed policy as well. Um, readings for this presentation include the Lavery reading, which I referenced in the previous presentation, and then a Ripner reading as well, both posted on Canvas. So, what is education policy and why should you care? Stop, we have our crossing guard here. Make sure you fully read library before we go on this really important. Library is a very, very critical text for our overall journey and kind of framing where we're sitting with education policy. So remember, Laswell said, everyone's favorite person, Harold Laswell, said, politics is an exercise in, who, uh, in determining who gets what, when, and how. Um, how does education fall into that? Can the government determine who gets education? Can they determine when they get education? How about how they get education? Well, the answer to all of those is obviously yes, right? We didn't, we've determined historically that people of color, women, transgender students more recently, um, all don't get education until we decided that they did. That is something that we, the government definitely has the power to do and have done. Government can definitely tell you when you get education as well. There's, there's state standards that say when students should be in what grade, and by what age. There's also um, laws and policies that determine when school starts, and that's really important as well. Then how they did education. Very, very important. This is something that can be set from the policies from the state level all the way down to individuals administering education, individual um, people determining how, how education is provided, what gets taught in the classrooms, how the classrooms are set up, all of that critical. Um, more importantly, what I want you to chew on though is the, the question of whether or not the government cannot decide these things. What happens if the government says, no, I'm not going to determine who gets education? What are the consequences of that? Education policy specifically is the system of laws and structures governing the education sector of our country. Um, there's, there's three primary subjects of education policy, but there's definitely other products that come from this. The first is students. They're the products, right? They're the, if we, we think about education as assembly line, they're the thing that's rolling down the assembly line, right? In this factory of education, students are the product that's getting spit out. Um, kindergarten through 12th grade is the easiest way to think about this. Um, and then, you know, sometimes products need a little extra polishing at the end. You got the, you got the car with all the extra um, gadgets and uh, we got a higher education. And it's um, all these different um, aspects make policy towards affecting students, right? Um, teachers also get affected by policy. They're also targets of public policy. Um, teachers are those ground level bureaucrats. They're the ones assembling the education. They're the ones producing education, working on the assembly line. And then finally, schools. Schools are these physical institutions in which uh, education is produced. They're the factory themselves. All of these are different subjects of education, over, uh, education policy overall. Um, if you ask me, so Trenton, what's the goal of education policy? And I would say, great question. And here's how I'd answer it. I'd say practically there's three different things that ed policy does. Determines the purpose of education. Why are kids going to school? What do we want them to learn? 
Um, and then we're going to create measurable outcomes to determine whether or not that purpose is being achieved. And then we're going to advise and direct on the methods to achieve the outcomes and the purpose. Right? That's really what ed policy does. Now, you say, Trenton, yeah, but I, I really want it to be super eloquent and from a uh, staller from the 1990s. And I'd say, okay, well, then I'll give you Lavery's definition and said, Lavery says the goal of education policy is threefold as well. First is democratic equality. That is providing for that engaged electorate by which the government can properly function. We want educated voters and we want educated people running for office. Um, social efficiency is the next one. This is giving the students the knowledge, skills, and abilities to succeed in our society. We want students prepared to be able to be functioning members of our society, um, get jobs, be able to pay their taxes. Whether we do those things well, different conversation, but it is one of the goals, right? And then social mobility. This is this is a big one, and this is a theme that we're going to come back to a couple of different times. I, there is a genuine belief in some very Americana-type, traditional, uh, American dream argument that if we provide equal education for all, then people can pull themselves up by their bootstraps, try really hard in school, and succeed beyond that. Um, this is this idea that we're allowing competition. We're allowing the the cream to rise to the top of the crop, right? We're allowing these the the best the best people to succeed regardless of their backgrounds. Uh, if you can't tell, I dripping with sarcasm, right? So this is one of those that that I I would argue that hasn't been around for decades, if ever, right? Even once we had equal, uh, once we had schools that were desegregated we still didn't really have equal education for all. Um, but Labrie is high-minded, he's a theorist, and he says that this is um, what the goals of education really are. I also want to kind of take you through this thought exercise of thinking about how you think about education. Um, we all have our perspectives. Um, we all have the different groups and different um, things that drive our ideologies. But let's think about education from a couple of different perspectives. Let's start with students. If you're a student, what is the purpose of education? Well, probably want future success, um, whether it's economic, social. Um, you, you, you go to school to learn these skills, to, learn, uh, to gain knowledge that helps you be successful in the future. Now, it's important to remember that this may not be the case for every student, uh, but my wife, who is a high school English teacher would definitely argue that not every school a student comes to school understanding that that's what they're getting at school and it's and it's hard to to have kids understand that that's truly what the education system is for how about as a parent if you're already a parent this one's easy for you if you're like me and you're not try to put yourself in that shoes what is the goal of education what is the purpose well you send your kids because you want generational wealth you want them to have a successful job so that your grandkids can have a have a good life you want your children to be successful you want them to succeed in life right and then sometimes you just want daily child care um you know i know for a fact that that there's not um not every parent approaches sending their kids to school with that same high-minded you know we're creating this generational wealth where we're you know potentially breaking the cycle of poverty that's not really what they're engaging with all the time sometimes it's just I have to work from nine to five and my kids being in school is in a lot of ways daily childcare, right? Um, and then as a, how about as a business owner? If you're a business owner, obviously easy for you, right? Um, you want a competent workforce, right? You want people who work for you to be educated, to know what they're doing, know what they talk, that they're talking about, right? And then sometimes you want an intelligent consumer base to make a rational decision between your product and another. And then sometimes you don't, and that definitely shades your perspective on education as well. On that, on that general train of thought, how about an elected official? We want, as an elected official, we want education, an educated electorate. We want them to be able to make rational decisions. We want them to be able to look at their choices and say, you know, I understand my values and this candidate represents my values better. We want them to, to not be fooled and make those competent decisions. Or not, or we don't want that, or the, you know, we want to undermine the education system in order to create a, an electorate that is not capable of making that rational decision, right? That is also a component of this. 
how about a non-parent member of the community? This is a this is a subgroup that's pretty unique to education policy. This is someone like me. I'm just a dude. I'm just an adult living in society. I'm not, other than teaching here, I'm not regularly engaged with schools, right? What is that purpose? Well, if you, if you engage with it, you're probably thinking, well, you know, better education leads to better economic outcomes. We want, we want a diverse, healthy economy. We want people getting educated and being successful, help the morale, help everyone be kind of happier, right? But the problem is, is that if we think about it, right, do these people engage with education regularly? Do they care? If you walked up on the street and asked someone who isn't in this class, what do you think about you know, your local school district? Probably not super engaged, right? The greater question is, do we want those people engaged? How important is that for, for the people not engaged with the system, people who aren't direct stakeholders, to, be, to care about what happens in our education system? It's definitely something to think about and something we're going to talk about as we go through the class, right? There's three different lenses when we talk about analysis of these policies, right? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use three different lenses, not gonna be super explicit, but these are the general, the general topics that these are gonna focus on. First is equity. Equity is how we evaluate education policy impacting disparate groups, right? This is anything from school segregation, both pre and post Brown v. Board of Education, to the structured zoning of schools, so how local um, localities and um, their governments put schools in different places. And then that deep, deep connection between socioeconomic uh, status and school access and success, right? There is mountains of research that say if you are in a wealthy neighborhood, you're likely going to go to a better uh, a school that achieves better student outcomes. That is just the nature of it. Um, and a lot of that has to do with finance, our second lens, right? We're going to evaluate how and why resources are attributed to various schools and programs, right? We're going to um, talk about the schema that school financing occurs through. We're going to talk about reform and privatization. Um, our Abrams book is a, all about reform and privatization and how that has impacted our school, how, how our schools have been turned into a commercialized uh, enterprise, right? We're gonna talk about various actors and institutions in education funding. We're gonna talk about the roles that wealthy white parents play in education funding. Great podcast in, um, in the important class resources called Nice White Parents. It's something that we're gonna talk about a little bit later on, but I do strongly recommend you picking it up if you have a regular drive or something and listening to it, it is fascinating to hear how how individually um, wealthy parents can influence what schools look like for everyone in the community. And then we're gonna talk about management. Management lens, we're gonna see the ground level impact of these policies and how they aff uh, affect the performance of educators, administrators, and students. On the granular level, what does this policy do to our education system? For example, as a child in, uh, who went to public school in the No Child Left Behind era, I saw standardized testing enter constantly. I regularly took CSAP tests that later turned into other acronyms that I don't know. Um, but you know, we're also we're going to talk about a, por a performance evaluation. So not only evaluating students through things like standardized tests, but we're how do you tell whether a teacher's doing a good job? How do you tell whether an administrator's doing a good job? Even, how do you tell whether a school district's any good? Um, school districts sometimes get closed down because they perform poorly. How do we, de how do we measure that? Um, and are the standards by which we're measuring measurable? Are, are, are they quantifiable? Are these subjective measures that we're, we're judging people on? And then no course would be um, complete without standardized testing and student achievement. We're going to do, you have a reading response in a couple of weeks reading the Pearson Guide for School Administrators on administering their standardized tests. And we're going to talk about how that type of culture that has been created impacts the overall quality of our education system. Uh, so these are these three different lenses that we're going to engage with. Um, I, w I want to take a step back. If you do have um, a lot of background in public policy. If you're, if you're saying, Trent, I'm super comfortable with my public policy. I don't need to hear what rational choice theory is. That's fine. Go ahead and skip ahead. 
I, this is mainly so that this interdisciplinary class has some sort of the same, the same, we're talking about the same language, right? Um, at this point, please read Ripner. Ripner is not something that I'm going to ask you to do a reading response on. It's probably not something you're even going to reference in an exam. Um, but it is an education policy scholar's explanation of what public policy is. She uses a lot of similar language. She thinks in the same way that I will th uh, discuss through these video lectures. So please go read that if you haven't. Super brief, but um, it's, it's a really good, a, a really good breakdown of public policy. Um, remember, public policy are the, arrays of, uh, the array of initiatives, programs, laws, regulations, and rules that the governance system chooses to produce. Now you're saying, Trent, come on. That's really cool, but I have no idea what a governance system is. And I'll say, well, relax, I'll tell you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in PA policy, governance is the system of decisions and actions made to run a government entity. The governance system goes beyond these public organizations. Interest groups, um, powerful private businesses and individuals, nonprofits, these all create this network that creates the governance system. That system is then what directs public policy. Um, public policy, there are some people in the public policy world who take a more narrow view of public policy, that it needs to be something that is written or something formal. I do not believe that. I instead argue that public policy is anything that is seen to affect a public institution. This goes anything from laws, to why I played the schoolhouse rock at the beginning. Um, bills that were introduced and not passed are public policy too. It's a statement. Um, actions taken by legislatures, direction given by commission or committees. The executive branch has a role in public policy as well. This is both presidents and governors. Um, executive orders, vetoes and veto statements, signing statements, these little passive aggressive notes that get left on your um, unsigned bills that presidents say, well, I don't agree with this. That is part of public policy. Um, the appointment and structure of administrative agencies. This is really important. Who runs the Department of Education is critical. The Department of Education looked vastly different when Arnie Duncan ran it during the Obama administration and then Betsy DeVos ran it during the Trump administration. The public policy system shifted dramatically. Um, and then these rules and regulations that these administrative agencies make, that all uh, part and parcel of that same public policy. Um, the judicial branch, obviously, huge role. These rulings, these written decisions, what they're saying, all critical. Um, all branches can do interviews, they can do press conferences, give statements to the media, and anything that seemed to affect the behavior of public institutions and public actors is public policy. If the president goes and gives an interview on NBC and says, I call on Congress to do this, that is public policy. Um, voters also directly impacted as well. Direct democracy has a huge role, especially in something like Colorado where voters can pass initiatives and referenda. Um, elections, recalls of official, all direct policy as well. And then public op opinion polling. Um, next week, uh, as part of our discussion of Fed Ed, um, I will make the argument and show that um, Barack Obama only passed his signature um, education bill to every student succeeds that when public polling f fully soured on the No Child Left Behind Act. Um, it is important. It is something that policymakers look towards. Um, there's a couple of different highlights. I'll run through these quickly. Pol public policy is relatively new. I don't want you to write and it's and say, oh, well, there's this there's this really big piece that I maybe I just don't know or I didn't read or I haven't read Wilson's treatise on public administration and the public uh, the po politics administration dichotomy and I haven't I don't know the Administrative Procedures Act through and through. You don't need to. What's great about a new field like public policy is that we're all creating the pile of knowledge together. Nothing is written in stone. Hell, what public policy is isn't even written in stone. And so you are free to engage with it and bring your insights. You're not breaking any sort of academic rule, right? Um, 
you know, public policy is about everything that affects public entities, right? This is controversial. Some people may disagree with that, and you're completely welcome to. But, um, you know, like I said, if a public figure gives an interview that is meant to, or even unintentionally, influences public entities, um, it's considered an act of public policy. Um, that's how I see that. Um, public policy is also a system. It's a, public, uh, a network of actors and laws that influence a, uh, government and society. Um, in education policy, we're discussing the larger network that interacts. We're never, we're never discussing, even when we're discussing an individual law or an individual action that someone took, it is in this larger context of what was going on at that time. Um, public policy is both academic and practical as well. Um, public policy and public administration in many places are still housed under political science, and people who study there may, may keep it more theoretical, um, un understanding, trying to understand themes rather than uh, in practice. But what's great about this field is that it is also an active right field for practitioners. People are creating and guiding and analyzing public policy legislative and administrative bureaucrats, elected officials, think tanks, all practice public policy. Um, it gives us on the ground experience to analyze, which not every field does, especially in a, in a liberal arts type uh, realm. And finally, public policy is a mess. Man, public policy can sometimes be frustrating. It is, there's not a lot of rules that govern everything. It's, 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 it's frustrating, but it's also exciting. Um, it, it's difficult to break down how policy is made, why it's made, the efficacy of the policies is all part of this larger field and we get to kind of wade through the mud together. Our job is to break down these component parts. We want to understand the actors, institutions, motives, and consequences. Um, some terms, if you're not familiar, the ones I want to point out here. Um, policy conditions, these are the conditions in which a, public pol uh, a policy is being made or proposed. Um, conditions change. If we have the conditions right for policy, it'll be brought up. If we don't, then policy may not happen. Um, and then rationalism. Uh, next week we're going to talk um, quite a bit about critical race theory. Or, no, that's funny. No, not CRT, RCT, rational choice theory. Uh, not confusing. Um, which is this idea that people act in a way that maximizes their utility. Um, they want to maximize outputs and minimize inputs. Um, get the most without putting in the most. Um, the fact that this is a really important theory in public policy and in education policy, and there's a lot of education, uh, a lot of things that are ha have happened in the history of American education that is guided by this theory. And education policy. I'm going to breeze through this as well. A couple of different um, systems. If you read Rickner, I, uh, you absolutely welcome to. Um, she breaks it down instead of by level of government, like this class is doing, she breaks it down into the different fields of education policy. So we have ECE, which is early childhood education. That's everything prior to kindergarten. K through 12, obvious, it's the most formalized one. It's got the most structure to it. And then higher ed, it's everything that happens beyond that. Colleges, universities, technical programs, and graduate programs. All, all are part of higher ed. Um, higher ed is also horribly ununified, and even institutions that are seemingly very similar are hard to compare because of the lack of um, similarity between them. Um, collectively, you may hear this referred to as the P20 system. So it's preschool through the 20th year, which would be the completion of a typical um, full graduate course load, right? Um, the P20 system is everything. Um, it, it, it encompasses it all. A lot of things that we're going to talk about are going to focus on K through 12, but there is applicability there to ECE and to higher ed. Um, key actors, um, school boards, superintendents, um, chief administrative officers, they're the, the professionals that are generally appointed by an elected body, a lot like a city manager. State boards of education. We're going to talk about state boards of education. Wow, are state boards of education appoint, uh, important? They review, direct, and administer statewide policies. If, 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 if a state requires schools to um, report test results by a specific date, that goes to the state board of education and the state department of education. It is something that, that uh, uh, is huge. Um, the secretary of education, someone like um, Betsy DeVos, um, is really important, but also, they're not necessarily telling teachers what to do. Instead, they direct, I believe it's over a billion dollars in funding each year that go out in the form of grants and loans to different schools um, through federal policies. Um, 
they are administer they are finance administer uh, administers, but they also play an important role in framing the debate and framing conversations about education. Boards of Regents, they are school boards, but for universities instead, public universities specifically. And then PTAs and PTOs. Podcasts I mentioned earlier are all about PTAs. These are dues-paying groups of parents who attempt to influence policy at specific schools, and they often do. Um, if, if we think about what we know about politics and policy overall, wealthy, middle to high income people generally tend to be white are the ones that could both afford the time to devote to a PTA and also can pay the dues to be part of the PTA. And um, it, it's all interconnected with the property tax uh, financing system for schools, but PTAs are really important. PTOs, on the other hand, are different. PTOs are a generic term for any open organization of parents and teachers. Um, this can be formed for very specific reasons, such as after you know something happens at the school, like a shooting, or it can be a standing group where the school will go and talk about changes to the upcoming year or something like that. Um, and then federalism. If you do not understand federalism, please reach out. Federalism is going to be huge, and I'm going to assume a lot of knowledge about federalism that you, you at least get the layer cake analogy, right? So federalism is this interconnection between the different levels of government we have in our country. We have the federal level, the state level, and the local level. They, they, they're passing money and information and everything back and forth. Um, this is really important because the federal government does not have direct influence over education policy. Spoiler alert for NetSuite, but education is not in the Constitution. Instead, it's been interpreted by courts to be a reserved right under the Reservation Clause of the Tenth Amendment. Um, the federal government basically provides overall direction and guidance through funding and intergovernmental transfers. Um, state governments are the ones that are, are doing the, the heavy lifting when it terms, comes to directing policy. Um, through legislation, through the state boards, and through the administration of property taxes and grants. Um, states also have a lot of control over curricula. Um, when we talk about the local level, um, most of the time in policy we're going to talk about cities and towns and counties. Um, other than counties collecting property tax though, there's not a lot of interaction between them and the education system especially in the West. Um, some cities in the East, some of the uh, older parts of our country may have more unified school districts and municipalities out West where I'm familiar, where my research has focused. Um, it's definitely separate and their independent entities are instead school districts. These subdivide our um, land and our schools and administer them for that subdivided region. Um, there's no logic to um, where school districts are, how big or small a school district should be. There's research trying to guess, but honestly, there's there's it, there's way too much that goes into it. Um, you can have two different cities that are both large cities. So we have Denver and we have Colorado Springs. Denver has one school district. It's twice as large as Colorado Springs. Colorado Springs has eight school districts. There's no logic to it. Um, it kind of just happens based off of the culture and based off of the needs at the time. Um, higher ed, ECE, have a less formal structure, a more variance. It's harder to compare. I will do my best to make sure as we talk about this sort of stuff to, to uh, talk about higher ed and ECE as well. Um, and those themes will transfer over, but a lot of our focus is going to be on that K through 12 level. Great. Okay, I'll leave you alone for this week. Again, thank you for taking this class. Make sure you're um, turning in your school retrospective so I can get to know you a little better. Um, complete your week one readings if you haven't already. Start next week's readings and start looking at your reading response, which is due on Friday the 27th. Thank you all and have a good rest of your day.